and that we would leave here in alignment with you. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. So it's uh, not much of a secret. We have been walking through the uh, study of the chronological gospels. And as we've been going chronologically through the gospels, uh, we have learned a lot about how the Lord works. We have learned a lot about how we can find ourselves easily distracted from the work of God. We can find ourselves uh, easily off-center. This morning, we're going to be looking at a passage that I think is, is and has been taught a little bit incorrectly. And as we look at it this morning, I think we're going to be encouraged by it. I think we're going to leave here challenged in our thinking, and I trust that the Holy Spirit will make those things happen. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 15, the same that we have been the last two weeks. The first week, which would have been two weeks ago, we looked at verses 1 through 9. Last week we looked at verses, well, we kind of backed up and we used verses 8 and 9 again, so verses 8 through 20. And then this morning we're going to look starting in verse number 21. Before I start reading, I just want to remind you of a few things we learned in the first 20 verses. The first thing we learned and that we were challenged with, if you'll recall, is that we cannot allow tradition or culture to trump the Word of God. We can't allow tradition or culture to trump what God says. Now you might think, well that's completely logical, everyone would be in agreement with that. I just want you to take note over the course of the next month, how many times you hear of churches or followers of Christ, Christians, saying that we should be more in tune with culture than we are with what God says. We should try more to line up with culture, but what happens when we try to line up with culture. Culture is constantly shifting. What stays the same? God's Word. And so we don't want to find ourselves shifting with the culture. What we'll find is we're so far away from who God is and what He wants for our lives that we're no longer, we're going to, be, we're going to end up being like the Pharisees. Remember the Pharisees, they had developed really their own system of theology. They had strayed so far from what God had commanded that they had a false religion. And that's what Jesus confronts over and over and over again. That false religion that the Pharisees had set up. And we certainly don't want to shift away from God's word and end up worshiping a God who does not exist. Because if you're not worshiping the real one true God, and he has clearly, clearly given himself to us and revealed himself to us through the scriptures. He revealed himself to us through Jesus Christ, and now we have the scriptures to be reminded of who he is. So we can't let tradition or culture trump the word of God. We learned that in the early part of chapter 15. As we moved more towards the middle, verses 8 and 9, we saw that we cannot simply pay lip service to God. We can't go through the motions and expect God to just say, Oh, you know what? That was nice. They showed up to church. I'm so proud of them. You know what? Uh, that's just all that I ever wanted from my people is for them to show up to church. I just want them to go through the motions. He doesn't want us to go through the motions. That's why he says in verse number 8 of chapter 15, These people, they honor me with their lips. Their hearts, they're far from me. He wants our hearts at all times. He goes on to say, they worship me in vain. Their teachings are but rules taught by men. They're not my heart anymore. And I don't have their hearts. That led us into point number three that Jesus teaches as he goes throughout chapter 15. And that's what is in our hearts will eventually come out. That was what we learned last week. What's inside will come out. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. If you find yourself speaking words of anger, speaking words of gossip, if you find yourself tearing people down, if you find yourself not showing compassion, if you find yourself in a position where you, it's like, man, it's hard to love anyone. 
I just can't stand people. Let me go live in a cabin by myself. Let me acknowledge that I have said that before. So if you've ever said that, I get it. I get it. I'm so thankful for the way that God has, over the course of many years, changed my heart to where instead of being cynical about people and with people, he has allowed me the opportunity to see that we are all in this process of trying to align more fully with who he is, being conformed to the image of Christ. And so if you are frustrated that I don't expect perfection from those who attend here at Northwinds or those that I meet in the community, I acknowledge this. We want to be in alignment with what God teaches but we are constantly being transformed and conformed to that image. And so why would I be frustrated with someone who is here when I was once there too? Rather, I would rather reach down with a hand and say, hey, let, let's help you along. Put the arm around the shoulder. Let me help you along this journey rather than push someone down and kick dirt while they're down. Why would we do that? Why would we do that? So what comes out of our heart really reveals what's within our heart. We find those actions being displayed. Well, we pick up in verse 21 this morning. And we read this. It says that leaving that place, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. He would be going north at this point, out of Galilee and into the region there of Tyre and Sidon. It says that a Canaanite, woman from that vicinity came to him crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is suffering terribly from demon possession. Seems like a little bit of an unusual response, but it says Jesus did not answer a word. So his disciples came to him and urged him, send her away, for she keeps crying out after us. This wasn't a one time, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter, I need your help with her. No, this was a continual begging of the Lord. And so the disciples have had enough. Send her away. She keeps crying out after us. In verse 24, he answered, and he's speaking to this woman at this point. He says, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. Verse 25, the woman came and knelt before him. Lord, help me. Now what do we know already? She's a Canaanite woman. He has just said, I've been sent to the people of Israel. She says, Lord, I still need you to help. Verse 26, he replied, talking about Jesus replying, It is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to their dogs. Yes, Lord, she said, but even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered, woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted, and her daughter was healed from that very hour. Now, I mentioned at the beginning that I feel that this passage a lot of times uh, gets preached in such a way that the focus is wrong, and I think even the interpretation and understanding of what Jesus was trying to say is oftentimes taken wrong and the focus sometimes becomes this oh my goodness did you see where Jesus said it's not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs he's calling this woman a dog how could he insult her that way and I've heard preachers say many times well that was common for an Israelite to call a Gentile or to call a Samaritan a dog. That would not have been unusual for that time. But what we see is that this woman isn't offended by what Jesus says. Jesus is not using some sort of a slur towards her. We're going to find as we teach through this passage, Jesus is using an illustration now here's also the reality, and I talked about earlier, remember we can't let culture trump the word of God. We live in a very sensitive culture. You notice that? And people get offended by everything. I sometimes read about like 
oh, this person said this, and there was such an uproar, and I'm like, get over yourself. Like, that, how was that offensive? You know, now there are things that people say that are offensive. I understand, but we live in a culture that looks to take offense. Do you guys understand that? You guys experience that sometimes? I got to be honest, sometimes I'm like, man, I wonder how long it will be. Because, I mean, our, it used to be I could preach, and I largely know the people in this congregation, and I largely know how you will react to things, and I have said for a really long time, give me enough time to speak, and I'll say something stupid. I mean, that's just the way that it is. I, maybe all of you, you, you guys are really good with every one of your words, but give me enough time, and I'm bound to say something stupid, all right? I think I said something stupid last week, if I'm remembering correctly. I, like, told you something that was bad, and I'm like, go ahead and try it. Now, that was just dumb, all right? I didn't want you to try what I told you was dumb, but I told you that anyway. So I've sometimes wondered to myself, how long before what gets put out online gets shared with someone who takes offense, and then there's an uproar over what Pastor Dave at Northwich, did you hear him say this? Well, the reality is this. The gospel is offensive to some people, to many people. The teachings of God's word are going to be offensive to a large number of people. And so I, I guess I'm somewhat prepared for the time when there is an uproar over what Pastor Dave or Pastor Kirk has preached here at Northwinds Church. Now, here's what I love about you guys. You guys expect me and encourage me to preach the word of God. And I appreciate that I have the freedom to come here and not wonder, like, okay, well, if I preach what the Word of God says, you know, somebody going to get, in and all, get, get, get all worked up. And I, I almost used a phrase that would probably cause people to, to be like, can you believe he said, I caught myself, all right? I'm improving. <laughs> but whenever somebody reads this and they say, well, Jesus says it's not right to take the children's bread and toss it to their dog. He's calling this woman a dog. I just can't handle that. I don't want to hear what he says. Well, as we work our way through this passage, and I'm going to back up and start teaching from the beginning of it, but just know that we're going to get to a, Jesus is using an illustration. It's a great illustration. We might not like the illustration. It might not make us feel comfortable, but the illustration is good nonetheless. Let's back up and let's see, starting in verse number 21. Jesus, it says, was leaving that place, and it says this, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre, in Sidon. It, it wasn't unusual for Jesus to withdraw. Here's what we need to understand. He was fully God while he was here on earth, but he was also fully man. He was the God man. Jesus got tired. Jesus ministered at a pace that most of us could not sustain. You might have heard me say before, I have uh, long since been in the habit of taking a Sunday afternoon nap. I am typically worn out after preaching, after teaching God's word. I'm typically worn out. Jesus would sometimes minister all day long. And sometimes, and, and actually if you go just a little bit farther in Matthew chapter 15, and I'm not going to really get into this this morning, but it says that the people had been with him for three days when it's talking about the feeding of the 4,000. So we're talking about Jesus having ministered at a pace that is hard to sustain on a very human level. Understanding that Jesus would exert strength, that he would exert effort in his teaching. Uh, people sometimes will look at a passionate preacher or a passionate teacher and they would say, well, man, he looks like he's worn out or he looks like he's sweating. He looks like he's working hard. It is hard work to teach and to preach at a high level and with passion on a consistent basis. I used to go into the public schools out in Pennsylvania and I got to teach them. And sometimes I would teach for three, four, five hours in a row. And I, I don't, I, I tried to figure this, I don't know how to teach and just say, okay, now... Here's something you need to learn. And everything I do is with like energy. Like I just, I don't know. I probably have issues. Um, 
I was looking to see if my wife was nodding her head. <laughs> if I could see into the back room, my daughter would certainly be nodding her head. Dad definitely has issues. But come, fi- come hour five of teaching with passion and with vigor, I tell you what, sometimes I felt like my, my voice was just not going to recover from that. And Jesus would minister for hours and hours, days and days. And he would sometimes withdraw himself, sometimes to a mountainside to pray, it says. And in this particular instance, he actually takes and removes himself from Galilee, where he had been ministering to the people there. He needs a time of rest. So whenever you read shortly after this that this woman is coming to him, and he doesn't respond, you might say, that's rude. That's rude. Now I'm going to point someone out this morning. I think he'll be okay with it. If not, then I'll know really quickly because he's sitting somewhat near the front. But uh, we, and, and, and I don't know if anybody, well, I'm trying to look around to see if anybody can figure out who I'm going to point out before I do it. I'm actually going to talk about Dawn for a moment. All right, so, so Erica comes to our administrative trustee meeting a couple of Wednesdays ago. And she tells us that uh, the, the next time we have a meeting, that she's going to be on vacation. But that Dawn has told her that since we now have the ability to Zoom, that she ought to still tune into the meeting. It's an hour and a half of your life. You can give up an hour and a half of your vacation to be part of the meeting. Now, Erica was here, and Dawn's like, I still think that's the right thing. (laughs) And everyone that was at that meeting told Erica, "Uh, you will not be tuning in via Zoom. (laughs) You are on vacation. I would not tune in via Zoom on vacation. I do not want to establish any sort of pattern where we're, whereby we say, well, now that we have the technology, I don't care if you're on vacation or not, you will be in this meeting. <laughs> I don't want to live up to that standard. <laughs> I want to be able to go on vacation and be on vacation. And, uh, and so whenever Jesus withdraws himself... For us to be frustrated that he doesn't immediately respond while he knows that he needs this rest. You want to talk about self-awareness. Anybody know someone who's reasonably self-aware? No, nobody. (laughs) Never met one of those people. All right, let me ask the question in reverse. Anybody know someone who's not very self-aware? All right, somehow or another we went to a unanimous vote. Jesus would have been the most self-aware person that ever walked the earth. He knows his body. He knows the strength that he has. And you say, well, why didn't he just ask God for more strength? Why didn't he just keep going and going and going and going and going? Well, he teaches in his ministry by what he does as much as what he teaches also. He teaches us something similar to what we saw back in the creation account where God takes the seventh day to rest, not because God's like, I can't possibly muster up any more strength. I, I have no more creativity. There's nothing more I could possibly think to do with creation. So therefore, I guess I'll rest on the No. He set us a pattern. And it's interesting to see that Jesus in his ministry still takes time to rest. He takes time to withdraw himself, and so he does that. And this woman comes to him. And he doesn't immediately respond. The disciples, understanding who Jesus was, and also sometimes not fully understanding his mission, are like, let's just get her away. Let's just get her away. And Jesus, as he often does, you know, there are a lot of times trying to get the children away, the disciples are. This time they're trying to get this Canaanite woman away. And and Jesus says, listen, I was sent, this is verse 24, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. Now, if you'll remember, this is the wonderful thing about teaching chronologically through the ministry of Jesus. If you'll remember whenever Jesus sent out the disciples, do you remember what he said to them? If you don't remember what he said to them, go back to chapter number 10. You're already in chapter 15, so you really just probably have to turn two, maybe three pages. I guess in mine you turn three pages. It depends on the print of your Bible. But you'll remember when he sends out the 12, he says this in verse number 5. Do not go among the Gentiles or enter any town of the Samaritans. Now, 
I specifically remember teaching this back then, and I'll just remind you of it now. It was okay that Jesus said to them, I want your ministry to be specific for this period of time. This is not the entirety of what God's word teaches. The reality is this, if, they, if the gospel was never extended to the Gentiles, we're in trouble, right? I'm a Gentile. I am not a Jew. And I would imagine the large majority of those in here today are not of Jewish heritage. Uh, and if you are, that's wonderful. But most of us have been extended grace and mercy as Gentiles. Ephesians talks about this, how we were once far from God, but now we've been brought near. If you'll remember, Paul was sent as a, minist- as a missionary to who? The Gentiles. The time came when Jesus' ministry was going to be extended to the Gentiles. It wasn't at the time that he sent out the 12 disciples and he brought them back in. That was a very specific ministry to the Jewish people. It wasn't even at this time. Jesus says, I was sent to the lost sheep of Israel. Now, he follows that up, or, or the woman follows it up as far as a response in saying this. She says, Lord... Help me. I still need help. I know you're saying you're sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. I know that I'm a Gentile. I know that I'm not deserving of what you have, but I still need help. Anybody ever felt as if you're in that position where you're crying out to God and you say, I need help. I need your help. Anybody ever been there? I have been there. I have lived there for extended periods of time. And the reality is this. Even though I feel like the Lord has gotten my feet on stable ground, on a firm foundation, I still need him every day. I was like, Lord, I need you today. I need you to help my thinking. I need you to help my actions. I need you to help my compassion. I need you to help my language. I need you to help in every area of my life. The moment that I start to believe that I no longer need Jesus is the moment that I start with self-dependence, and self-dependence is never going to turn out right. She says, Lord, I need help. Will you please help me? Well, Jesus follows that up, verse 26, and says this, it's not right to take the children's bread and toss it to their dogs. Now, I want us to understand this illustration, and maybe one of the ways that I want to do is I want you to flip to a parallel account. Uh, Only one gospel over. We're going to the gospel of Mark, and we're going to be in chapter number 7. So Mark chapter 7. Seeing the parallel account, we see the wording be slightly different. Verse 27, after she had begged Jesus to drive the demon out of her daughter... Jesus says, first let the children eat all they want, he told her. Now, when you read that parallel account, and it doesn't make the account different, it just adds to the fullness of the account. We've talked about this many times. The more people that you have talking about a certain account of an event, the better the picture you get, because everybody comes from a slightly different angle. So in this In this instance, Mark records, first let the children eat all they want, for it's not right to take the children's bread and toss it to their dogs. And so I want you to picture a meal. Let me ask you this. How many of you have a dog? How many of you have a dog that lives in your house? All right. Excellent. Quite a few of you. We do too. I love Sophie. I tell you what, though. She was driving me nuts last night. That dog would not leave me alone. I was trying to sleep. And she would up with me and down off me and up with me and down. I'm like, would you make up your mind? I'm okay. I love sleeping beside Sophie. I think she's awesome. I enjoy her just cuddling up. It makes me feel warm and fuzzy inside. (laughs) I like my dog, okay? Any, any, Any of the rest of you, you understand what it's like. And I got myself in trouble by talking about cats a few weeks ago. So we're not going to talk about cats this morning. The only reason we're not talking about cats is because the Lord talks about dogs. Okay. I can't make this stuff up. Just sharing the word of God. You guys are taking this all the wrong way. If you have a dog and you're eating a meal, what is your dog? Man, no, I should probably back up. We didn't train Sophie really well. Like we didn't like, hey, it's we're gonna eat, and so you eat while we eat. Like 
no, you can just sit there at the table and kind of like, Now, sometimes we do give her a bone. She loves bones. But when we eat, we're determined to eat what's in front of us. We don't take the main food, and we don't give it to the dogs. Or dog, we only have one. We don't give it to Sophie and say, hey, I know we made a roast for lunch, but uh, tell you what, we eat the dog treat. <laughs> you eat the roast. We don't do that, Right? So I want you to picture Jesus is setting up this illustration. And he says this. He says, it's not right to take the children's bread. They're eating around the table. It's not right to take what they're eating and just say, okay, you have it. We aren't going to eat that bread anymore. Now remember the context of this. Jesus says, my mission is to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now his mission is going to expand, but at this time... It is time for the children of Israel to eat, so to speak. They are given the opportunity to eat. You say, well, I just, I don't think that's right. I don't think, that's the way that God designed the mission for Jesus. Like, I'm not making this up. This is what Jesus says. Now, here's the immense amount of faith. And here's where the illustration just becomes phenomenal. And it's almost like, now listen, Jesus knew exactly what was going to happen. But it's almost like this woman takes Jesus' illustration and was like, okay, I get it, but what about this? We could make this part of the illustration too. And that's where it comes in. And she says, okay, I get it. It's not right to take the children's bread while they're eating and just toss it to their dogs. We stop eating. They get to eat. That just wouldn't be right. Nobody would do that. But she says in verse 28, I'm still in Mark 7, Yes, Lord, but even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. So even while they're eating, instead of, so here's how it would sometimes work. Okay, we have finished eating, and now the dogs can get some of what we have had. There's going to come a time when the Gentiles get the full blessing uh, it's already happened, but I'm saying as far as how Jesus is looking at it, there's going to come the time when the Gentiles get the full blessing. That's always been in the plan of God. Right now, he says, I'm ministering to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. I have withdrawn myself to be able to get some rest. And so, yes, I'm in a Gentile territory. But get this. She says, even while they're eating, I'm not asking you to take what's theirs and give it to us. I'm just saying that while people eat, They've got crumbs and they fall down and I would take a crumb. Do you understand the faith of this woman to say, I'm not even asking to eat the full meal, but I would take a crumb from the table of Jesus any day. And Jesus says, for such a reply, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. If you flip back to Matthew, he says something really remarkable in verse 28. Woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. You have great faith. You haven't just accepted that I said I'm here to minister to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. You haven't even just accepted my illustration and saying there will come a time. Right now it's the time when I'm ministering to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. There will come a time when you will be able to also eat. And again, he's not calling her a dog. He's using an illustration. You say, well, I don't like that. I'm offended by it. I've gotten into the habit, I hope you do too, I don't get offended by the, the illustrations that Jesus uses. He always uses the right illustration. If you don't like it, you're the one that's wrong. Okay? Like, that's just the reality of it. If you don't like that, then we've got an issue with how you respond to the word of God. and That just goes into a whole different realm. Jesus uses this illustration. He says, I'm ministering here, we're at the table. You will eventually be able to partake as well. And she says, yeah, but even while they're eating at the main table, crumbs fall, and I would take a crumb. I titled this morning's message, Pass Me the Crumbs. Because here's the reality for all of us. We should gladly eat 
the crumbs from the table of Jesus than a meal from any other table. We should gladly just soak up everything that Jesus is willing to give. And let me just be honest with you this. We don't have to worry about this. Jesus isn't holding anything back right now. Jesus isn't holding anything back from us. So we aren't like this Gentile woman who needed to come and needed to say, I know that right now you're ministering to the children of Israel, but I need a crumb. My daughter is possessed by a demon, and I need Jesus. I have heard. Now, you could go back in the Gospel of Mark, and you would see that other times, people from Tyre and Sidon, they have come, and they have brought people to Jesus. They are aware of what he has done, what he is capable of doing. In fact, everyone around was aware of it. Jesus, everywhere that he went, even when he would try, in this case, to withdraw and not be found. You can find that in Mark chapter 7. He enters the house. He's like, I hope nobody finds me here. And what do they do? They find him. And what does Jesus do? He still ministers. I want to challenge us this morning to be willing to take everything that Jesus is willing to give to us. We sometimes are like, we're just, we're like Pastor Dave. And here's what I mean by that. I'm a picky eater. You throw peas on the table... I'm sorry, but I'm not eating those peas, all right? You throw broccoli on the table, you throw anything that's green, other than green beans or Mountain Dew, and I'm going to have a hard time eating those things, and so like I select what I want. I also don't like my food to touch. You guys are like, now how, how many of you are, all, anybody else like you don't like your food to touch? Thank you. Oh, thank you. Wow. Ava, your hand. What? Yes. See, Mom, I told you I've been right the whole time. Pastor Dave even says it now. <laughs> Here's what we do in our Christian faith. We are like the picky eaters such as Pastor Dave. It's like, well, I'll only eat it if we have this. And I'll only eat it if... If Jesus will give me peace, but he won't disrupt this part of my life, then okay, I'll take the peace. I don't really want this, but I'll take this. And here's what I want to challenge us with this morning. Jesus isn't asking us to eat crumbs any longer. He's giving us everything that we need for life and for godliness. And instead of having even a fraction of the faith of this woman who says, I'll take the crumbs. I'll take the crumbs from the table of Jesus. We get to, we get to eat at the table, full course meal. And we're like, nah, maybe later. Nah, I don't know if I'll like how that works. I don't know if I'd like him really like blowing up that area of my life. I don't really know if I want to live as a person of genuine love and compassion. I don't know if I want him to affect my language. I don't know if I want him to affect how I view my time. I don't know if I want him to affect how I view other people. I don't know if I really want to take Jesus into my workplace. I don't really know if I want to take Jesus into my home. I want to continue being angry. I want to continue losing my temper. I want to con this is how I've always been. My challenge to us this morning is twofold. Jesus says to this woman, you have great faith. Now if you would do, I'm just going to give you a website here. You can jot it down if you want. I, I sometimes will go to this website. It's called blueletterbible.org. Blueletterbible.org. And here's what you can do on blueletterbible.org. You can put in a word... It's like the old concordances of the day. Anybody ever own a Strong's concordance? Like the things like this thick, you know, it's like this big. You got to lug that baby. When I was in college, I still had to carry one of those things. I'm dating myself there. Blueletterbible.org. You can go and you can punch in a word, faith. Let's just take the word faith and you punch that in. I think it's 257 times that you find the word faith. I, you can also go in there and do an advanced search and limit it to just the New Testament. You can limit it to just a, a, another book of the Bible. 
But if you would look at how many times you would find Jesus saying, O ye of little faith, why do you have no faith? Why is your faith lacking? And you find here, he says to this Gentile woman, you have great faith. It's not the first time that he said to a Gentile, you have great faith. In fact, you find that as he talks about great faith, many times it comes from those outside of the realm of what they would consider the religious community of that day. And so my first challenge to us is this. As those who gather together to worship God, those who gather together in the name of Jesus, do we have great faith? Do we have little faith? Or do we have no faith? I want us to think about that for a moment. Faith would say this. Man, I tell you what, if I could get a crumb from the table of Jesus, I'd be set. A lack of faith is, yeah, well, I know that Jesus has done this and this and this, but I don't really expect him to do anything else. I don't really trust him with my family. I don't really trust him with my uh, job. I don't really trust him with my, and you can just kind of fill in that blank. I'll just pick and I'll just choose. Sounds like the Pharisees, the teachers of the law. Here we go. We're going we're to focus on this. Jesus says, oh my goodness, you've missed the heart of the matter. I want your heart. So I want us to be challenged with our faith. When you face an obstacle in life, it's the first thing that you do is, all right, Lord, I need you. Or is the first thing that you do, you start to worry, you start to call people, you start to look things up on the internet. I mean, we got a lot of people with uh, doctor degrees in here, I know, from Google. Um, <laughs> I'm talking to myself, too. You would have no idea how many times I've Googled medical issues that I've had. <laughs> Not the heart attack. I didn't Google that one. <laughs> Can we get to the point where it's like, I know that I need you. Every moment of every day of my life, I need you. And so I trust you with all of these things. She had great faith. I'm challenged by this woman's faith. Second thing is this, it's a similar type thing. Our faith leads us to be willing to take a crumb. <laughs> Do you realize that in this illustration, what this lady got was a crumb from the table of Jesus? But when she got a crumb from the table of Jesus, you know what happened? She got all that she needed. <laughs> she got all that she needed. You know what your greatest need is? It's a spiritual need. You need Jesus. The solution to your problems is not more money. Your solutions to your problems is not more time. Your solution to the problems is not, and you can just fill in that blank, you need Jesus. This woman got it. This woman got it. This woman outside of the realm of the religious community got it better than anyone else. And Jesus says, woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. You got a crumb from the table of Jesus, and a crumb from the table of Jesus is all you need. Again, Jesus has opened up the table completely to us. Are you eating at that table? Are you getting the spiritual nourishment that you need? If you're struggling in life, I, I would drive you to Jesus. If you don't feel like you see a way forward, I would drive you to Jesus. This woman who knew that she needed help goes to Jesus. Jesus says, I'm only ministering to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But Lord, I still need help. Was well, not right to take what's on the table and feed it to the dogs during the mealtime. 
There will come a time when you'll get it, but I need help now. You know what? I tell you what, Jesus, even the dogs get to eat the crumbs during the meal. So I'll take a crumb. And this morning, I would encourage all of us to just go home with this mentality. All right, Lord, if all that there was was a crumb, I would take it from you. Again, he's opened up that table for us. But I would say this, and it's something that I'm trying to adopt in my life. All right, pass me the crumbs. <laughs> pass me the crumbs. I'll take them. If they're from the table of Jesus, I'll take the crumbs. And Jesus says, you know what, I'll let you eat the whole meal. Will you go to the table of Jesus this morning? Will you go to him for your needs? Will you go to him for your desires? Will you understand the teaching of today? I'm, again, challenged by the faith of this woman. Jesus doesn't respond right away, and she keeps going back to him. When Jesus does respond, he says, I'm not, my current ministry is not to minister to you. And she, and she says, I still need help, and I know you're the answer. Jesus gives an illustration and says, it's just not right. And she says, yeah, but I, I could eat the crumbs. And Jesus says, I tell you what, you have great faith and your request is granted. Will you turn to Jesus today? Will you trust him fully? If you haven't yet for salvation, I encourage you to do that today. And if you've been holding back life, oh my, that you would understand the abundant life there is when you release your life to him. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for the challenge of it. Thank you for driving us again and again to come and like this woman did, say, Lord, I need you. I need your help. We're so, so much of a independent people. We're so used to trying to do things for ourselves and by ourselves and in our own power that maybe as much as ever, this message should ring true to us to say, you know what, I need that dependence on Jesus. I need the faith of this woman. I need to be in the same place as what she was where she said, Jesus, Lord, I need your help. So right now, whatever area it is that you are wanting released to you, and I would imagine that across this room and online as people are tuning in, the need is completely different. Going from one end of the spectrum of life all the way to the other end of the spectrum. You're revealing to people right now the areas in which they need to say, Lord, I need your help. Lord, I'll take a crumb. A crumb from your table, Lord, is better than a, a, a full course meal at any other table. It's better than a meal at the table of, of independence. It's better than a meal at the table of, of self-reliance. It's better, better than a meal at the table of the freedom to do everything we want. Meal at the table, a crumb at the table of Jesus. Lord, that's what we want from you. Thank you for opening up the full table to us. We have full access because of what you've done for us. By your grace and by your mercy, we can be your children. We can eat at the table. And oftentimes we choose not to. May you challenge us this morning with what we need to release to you, the crumbs we need to eat, what we need to eat from that table. Not pick and choose. You get it all. Thank you, Lord, for what, you've te what you're teaching me and what you've taught us this morning in Jesus' name.